am a knight who swore loyalty to the kingdom. These are the final memories of this town and of my best friend. Nature is defined by many things. History, change, curiosity, versatility, beauty, strength. There are as many experiences to have in our world as there are grains of sand on it. A multiplicative marvel. But if there is one thing all of nature experiences, at least once, it is tragedy. Everything we do, everything we are, eventually faces an end. Everything fades in a process we call tragedy. History is forgotten, change is undone, strength bested and beauty withered. It is the natural course of the world. Even right now, tragedy can be witnessed by looking at the scenes of its aftermath. One such scene is the frigid, desolate land known only as the Citadel. Long ago, a distant kingdom established a forward base among the icy spires and evergreen forests of this area. The base was a large castle, a fortification worthy of its name, a Citadel. It served as a branch hub of the larger kingdom, and before long, settlements and towns began springing up around the castle, attracted by the promise of work, stability, and safety. Patrolled by the Kingdom Knights, and occasionally visited by representative of the Hunter's Guild, this area lived in peace for some time. But, not even a single lifetime ago, this peace shattered. As if taken by a frenzy, the local monsters began attacking the village, ripping it apart in the dark of night. The number of casualties is still unclear, but between death and evacuation, the entire area was left abandoned by the time dawn broke. The battle leveled the town and split the castle clean in half, as it sits there now, a broken monument to oblivion. The citadel of today is shaped by this history. While nature has reclaimed much of the zone, the traces of man are visible everywhere. In the forest, derelict churches stand among the tallest trees, with small, roofless huts hiding within the tall grass underneath. The western swampland is still adorned with walkways and piers to accommodate those who are long gone. Various small outposts and ruins litter the area, as well as occasional hidden treasure stashes. The life savings of someone who certainly doesn't need them anymore. In the east, the citadel itself still stands. Broken, crumbling, it marks the area through its high arches, its ruined buildings, its bent dragonator. The moat and canals around it attract local wildlife, and its insides remain a tantalizing target for archaeologists and grave robbers alike. But nature ultimately rules supreme. In the north, Icy mountains stand taller than the castle could ever hope to match. These frost plains, penetrated by caves and crowned by pointed spires, have frozen many of the underlying structures in time. In the southeast, a taiga forest emerges, holding lush wintry greenery, swamps and poisonous trees. Of particular note are the enormous mammoth trees that make up these woods, tall and imposing. They provide an arboreal habitat for many species when standing, 
and reshape the land once they fall. A cracked mammoth tree is especially impactful, as its tree sap can flow out with such intensity that it can mix with mud and swampland to create what is called a resin mire, a sticky marsh that ensnares unwitting traversers. But even this breeds life. The thorny toad, a small amphibian that only lives in this area, nests and lives in the resin mires, ready to defend its home if necessary. Both in the forest and the frost plains patrols another species that is entirely unique to the citadel, the boggy, a kind of bird wyvern. Its exact classification has not been determined yet, but what is for certain is that these furry, bulky beasts are extremely mischievous, harassing travelers in packs while some members holler and cheer in the background. Their scales have the trademark qualities of chainmail and are supremely durable, meaning that the boggy generally don't have to worry about much. To them, the ruined structures are but a delightful playground. In fact, the citadel houses many species unique to it. Back when humans lived here, they recounted the tales of many strange and unknown creatures, monsters that were neither friend nor foe, simply guardians of the forests and the frost. It took some time, and diplomacy, before the guild was allowed and able to venture into this territory to catalogue the fauna. Among the first properly discovered was the Garangolm, mostly because it would have been hard to miss. This humongous fanged beast, possibly the largest of its entire class, can often be observed sleeping peacefully among the trees. Its size and tough brown shell armor prevent most predators from even trying to disturb it, so the Garangolm is used to being left to its own devices. Its idle behavior serves an important purpose for the ecosystem. Its oddly shaped tail scrapes the ground behind it, tilling the soil and softening it up, so that it is ready to receive and incubate plant seeds of all kinds. On a single stroll, the Garangong can accidentally prepare and plant an entire small forest. In return, it might snack on some of the soil though. As it moves around, the Garangong excretes a kind of sweat that is in consistency similar to tree sap. This golem thick juice, as guild hunters have come to call it, works as an immensely concentrated fertilizer, able to promote plant growth at exceptional speeds. So, as it strolls past the soil it tilled before, the Garangolm sweats and fertilizes the soil with its thick juice, maintaining a cycle of continuous growth and fertility. This juice is so powerful that it even causes plants to grow directly on the Garangolm's body if the sweat accumulates and stays on the shell for too long. The beast doesn't seem to mind though. What it does mind, however, is being harassed. The Garangolm is a patient and placid creature, but it is not spineless. Should it be provoked, be it by a pack of boggy or a group of hunters, it will retaliate tenfold, as once it begins raging, it cannot be easily stopped. Its sheer size and strength is enough to pulverize most enemies, as it stomps and slams its limbs around violently. For those that inspired yet deeper rage, the Garangolm has a special treat. When furious, the Garangolm can coat its arms in its sap-like juice and then stick them deep into the earth. The sap promotes plant growth rapidly and, in elevated concentrations, also heats up rock. This allows the Garangolm to cover its arms with a variety of natural supplements, such as clumps of sticky wet moss or molten magma rock. Its fists gain extra elemental properties through this trick, as the Garangolm now has access to water and fire as additional weapons. By causing the molten rock on its arm to explode, the Garangolm can even propel itself through the air, somewhat mitigating its sluggishness imposed by its mass. As the Garangolm becomes angrier, it produces more sap, thus covering more and more of its body in these elemental armaments. 
When fully livid, it gains a helmet of rock and moss and begins blowing out steam between its shell plates to further harm and batter its enemy. As a last resort, it can also raise a massive rock from the soil and cause it to explode with its magma arm, a move that depletes its sap but also generally obliterates its targets. Luckily, the Garangon does not have many such targets. Despite its fierce appearance, it is not an active threat to most of its surroundings, and in times gone by, farmers would rejoice whenever a Garangon would settle down near their farms, as it would surely bring health to their crops. But even this gentle giant betrayed humanity on that fateful night. The tail that had tilled the soil now broke down doors and swept at farmers. The fields upon which man and monster had toiled in unison were trampled, destroyed by a frenzied horde, a cataclysmic anomaly. This town was built around a citadel. The guards here had nothing to stave off but the cold. It was peaceful, but dull. However, this led to a lack of vigilance, causing us to overlook the beginnings of a tiny anomaly. Not all creatures around the citadel used to be so peaceful. Even before the night of the anomaly, some monsters were generally more threatening and dangerous to its inhabitants. Like any other ecosystem, this zone is also inhabited by many predators. From Tigrex to Xenogar, most powerful and dangerous monsters have been sighted here at least once over the years. The two biomes here, the icy mountains and the taiga forest, allow for a wide variety of species to coexist at various points in the year. The more versatile the species, the likelier it is to appear near the citadel. However, one species that is endemic to this area puts all other trespassers to shame when it comes to versatility. The old folk of the citadel have long since told stories of the Moonlight Nocturne, a legend in which a howling specter of freezing wind barrels through the streets and nabs livestock and children alike. The guild has since identified this as the work of a Luna Garen, a fanged wyvern closely related to the Odogaren and Tobikadachi of the New World. Like its two relatives, the Luna Garen is a sleek and agile monster, able to outrun most of its prey with ease. Its sharp claws and fangs make quick work of any target, its thick and heavy tail allows it to counterbalance its rapid movements. This deep blue wyvern is a staple species of the area, and can often be found howling at the moon at night. However, it patrols a wide habitat and has been sighted in various areas and climates, such as the Frost Islands, the Kamura region, and even the Terosu jungle. As a native of the Citadel area, the Luna Garen is adapted to living in the cold, so how can it venture into such a diverse a range of locales, even going as far as to appear in tropical environments? The answer lies in the Luna Garen's chest, an organ called a lunar blue core. This structure is bound to the Luna Garen's respiratory system, and all the air it inhales has to go through this organ. But the blue core is also connected to the Luna Garen's frost sac, which gives it a special function. As the Luna Garen breathes, the blue core cools down the air it inhales and spreads it across the body, dousing the wyvern in a cold haze. This unique thermoregulatory mechanism allows the Luna Garen to keep its body temperature exactly as cold as it likes, no matter the outside temperature or humidity. Thus, while it cannot venture into volcanic zones, its habitat options are much wider than one would expect of a monster so uniquely adapted to the ice. Armed with this versatility, the Luna Garen is a peerless hunter, able to act efficiently in any environment it invades. Thanks to its blue core, it also has access to a freezing breath should it need to incapacitate capricious prey. 
but even a Luna Garen can find itself cornered, which is when it reveals its trump card. Having a low body temperature inherently inhibits movement and muscle activity, which means that for most of its life, the Luna Garen fights with a handicap. Once a sufficiently desperate fight presents itself, it can activate the blue core's alternate mode. In this mode, inhaled air is separated into two streams, one that supplies the blood with oxygen that does not pass through the blue core and one that does. The latter airstream is cooled as normal, but instead of it being spread across the body, the cooled air is instead vented through specialized pores across the Lunagaran's body. While the outside of the creature stays cold, the insides begin heating up and so, the thermal limits on the muscles are removed. This causes a swelling and increase in muscular performance, an increase so drastic that it allows the usually quadrupedal Luna Garen to stand up on its hind legs for increased periods of time. At the same time, the concentrated excess cold air that is constantly being ejected from the body causes icicles to form all around the wyvern's body, functioning as armor, elemental enhancement, and threat display all in one. In this state, the already fierce Luna Garen is a terrifying force of nature. Going bipedal gives the deadly claws on its front limbs much more range and mobility, enhanced by the Luna Garen's specialized shoulder joints that give them a similar range of motion to that of primates. Its deadly swipes and charges make short work of most opponents, and the truly unlucky might even discover that these hands are dexterous enough to grab prey before tearing it to shreds. It cannot however stay in this bipedal state for too long. Since it is activated by turning off its thermal regulation, this mode causes the Luna Garen to overheat, which is very dangerous for a creature that usually prefers the cold. But even that consideration did not stop it from wreaking havoc on the citadel, alongside every monster in the area, on the night of the anomaly. The creatures living near the city suddenly became violent. At first only a few, but every day there were more. And then one night, monsters began attacking, sieging the walls and destroying the town and the citadel, we were all caught off guard. But not all current inhabitants of the citadel were present during the attack on the castle. Some creatures are relatively new arrivals, having found a niche for themselves after the evacuation of the human settlers left the area ripe for some sweeping ecological changes. After the humans had left, new tales began emerging from the forests and ruins of the citadel. Guards and merchants reported an eerie wailing that would engulf the woods on some nights. A report not unlike the legend of the Tiger of Malice in Kamura. Soon enough, these reports led to the discovery of a new variant of Magna Malo. The Scorned Magna Malo. Regular Magna Malo have two priorities in life. For one, they must continuously expand their hunting grounds to ensure a steady supply of bone marrow, which fuels their signature hellfire gas. Said gas coats the armored plates of the Magnamalo to protect them from damage. This is crucial for the second goal, mating. The Magnamalo's mating hierarchy is heavily dependent on the size, shape, and general state of their armor plating. For males, the most important factor is their horn crown. Only males with the largest, most elaborate horns will get to mate consistently. Conversely, should a male Magnamalo lose a horn by having it broken off, it will be exiled and shunned from all interaction with its species. Who would want to waste their time with someone who can't defend their most precious feature? It was long believed that Magnamalo that had their horns broken would simply limp out into the wilderness to die, as they stood no chance of survival or procreation. And indeed, that likely is what happens to many of them. But in the Citadel, 
an alternative fate for these individuals was discovered. The Scorned Magna Malo, a Magna Malo covered in cracked armor, scars, and adorned by a broken and battered horn crown. This variant seems to develop when a Magna Malo has its horns broken, yet refuses to give up on itself. It instead focuses on expanding its territory and honing its skills. Due to not having to waste energy on finding a mate or protecting its armor, these Magna Malo unleash devastating latent powers that allow them to feed more frequently on more nutritious and powerful prey, thus further enhancing their abilities and their hellfire. This cycle produces a self-destructive, violent lifestyle of constant conquest, which eventually twists the creature into the scorned Magna Malo found in the Citadel today. It seems to be a fairly recent emergence, possibly even a consequence of the Magna Malos that were fought and defeated during the rampages in the Kamura region. As they are now, scorned Magna Malo are among the fiercest creatures known to the guild. Like their regular brothers, these fanged wyverns retain the speed, power and ferocity that they are infamous for. Scorn Magna Malo enhance these behaviors through their heightened aggression and recklessness, however. Completely unconcerned with the state of their armor, Scorned Magna Malo rip and tear into their victims until the deed is done. Their chipped arm blades are much more destructive than the elegant swords they once were. Their hellfire has been bolstered through ceaseless feeding and thus burns even hotter now, able to explode and incinerate much more ferociously. The Scorn Magna Malo can even coat its arm blades in hellfire to further push the limits of its capabilities. This is as far as most Scorned Magna Malo go. But, on certain occasions, hunters have reported back to the guild, their eyes wide with terror, and described a further level of power in Scorned Magna Malos. Rare individuals can, if under enough stress, stand upright and roar before unleashing a new, red hellfire that is ejected through the same pores as the regular, purple hellfire. This secondary flame is much more destructive and can even penetrate the ground and explode from below. After further research, it was revealed that this secondary hellfire was colored by and contained traces of Dragon Element. With a few exceptions, this element is unique to Elder Dragons, and it's only through a pre-existing organ or immense evolutionary pressure that a non-dragon can utilize it. The Scorn Magna Malo has neither, no dragon sack and, as a variant, no genetic and evolutionary differences from the regular species. So how this fanged wyvern can use this powerful force is still a mystery. The most logical explanation is also a terrifying one. Hellfire is the product of the wyvern's metabolism, so one way for it to become doused in dragon energy would be through the scorned Magna Malo feeding on elder dragons. This is however highly disputed within guild halls. The townsfolk panicked in the dark and ran to escape. It was pure pandemonium. My fellow knights were slaughtered one by one. One of the monsters was unlike anything I had seen before, but its appearance reminded me of the dragon of old legends. After humans abandoned it, this area became a frequent meeting spot for creatures such as the scorned Magna Malo. Powerful monsters ready to push themselves beyond their inherent limits. Few of them nest here, however. They come, they fight, they leave. Wanderers are common. Some are more fascinating than others. And some have been coming to this place for much longer than humanity remembers. For example, every once in a while, the citadel houses a Gore Magala. This is among the most mysterious creatures the guild has ever discovered. Next to nothing is known about its evolutionary origin. It has six limbs, four legs and two wings, which would normally put it into the Elder Dragon category. However, 
it has not been officially classified as such. In fact, it has no actual classification. A Gormagala is simply a Gormagala. Through observation, it was determined that a Gormagala is a sort of juvenile. Its dark shell is unusually tough, and it even comprises the creature's external teeth, which are essentially just spikes directly connected to the jaw armor. Its wing arms are highly articulate and even sport opposable thumbs, able to grab prey and opponents alike. Perhaps most curious are its wings, which are covered in a sort of thick, dark fur, highly unusual for any winged creature. These wings are usually folded together on top of the Gormagala's back, and only unfurl when the creature must fly or fight. A striking feature of the Gormagala is that it is blind. It has no eyes, and the face is entirely covered in dark shell plating. The Gormagala senses its environment with a unique sensory mechanism. The fur on its wings constantly sheds off of them, creating tiny aerosol particles that attach to just about anything. Inside the Gormagala's head lies a specialized organ that can sense the relative distance, temperature, and rough shape of anything those particles attach themselves to. By spreading out its fur particles, the Gormagala is able to sense its surroundings, and the more of its surroundings are coated in those particles, the more accurate the picture that the Gormagala gets of them. Gormagala are not just aggressive, but also quite intelligent. When engaging an enemy, they initially fight fairly conservatively, using basic tackles and charges to inflict moderate damage. The attacks are not the point. What matters is that while fighting, the Gormagala unfurls its wings, continuously spreading its fur particles. The longer the fight goes on, the better the Gormagala senses grow, as more and more of the environment is coated in its sensory particles. Once its senses have reached their zenith, the Gormagala begins the fight properly by extending two horn-like feelers from its head. These feelers are directly connected to its sensory organ and, combined with the immense amount of sensory particles scattered around, grant the Gormagala full confidence on the environment and the enemy. This allows the creature to fight at full power, crushing enemies with swipes and charges. But the Gormagala's true weapon is one that bides its time. The fight itself is secondary. The opponent had already lost the moment it got into the Gormagala sensory range. On its fur particles, as well as in the creature's breath, sits a deadly pathogen called the Frenzy Virus. This airborne disease is the Magala's trump card. As it coats the environment in its sensory hairs, it also spreads this virus around. Once a sufficient quantity of it has been absorbed by a living creature, it will begin affecting the nervous system of the victim. By manipulating parts of the brain, the frenzy virus unlocks the limits on the muscles that most creatures have, allowing them to use more of their physical strength. It also, however, disables their risk assessment and makes them hyper-aggressive, thus causing the afflicted to tear themselves apart with their own strength. Thus, the Gormagala does not need to deliver a killing blow. After enough time, any in its presence will go mad with newfound power and inevitably succumb to their own recklessness. This is a gamble, however. Creatures with enough sapient willpower can actually resist the mental effects of the virus, and can genuinely benefit from their unlocked strength without risking death. This is, however, quite rare. But a Gormagala is not really a fighter. It can defend itself fine enough, but its true purpose is to find a sanctuary. A place where it can evolve. This is no easy task. The juvenile Magala must travel for multiple years to grow its strength, and then it must find a secluded mountaintop where it will not be disturbed. There are only a few known Magala sanctuaries in the world, the most prominent one being among the peaks 
of Heaven's Mount on the Siki Country Archipelago. But one other possible spot is right here, at the highest spot of the Ice Mountain Range near the Citadel. Once there, the Gormagala begins to molt, shedding its dark skin bit by bit, carefully and methodically. Out of the blackened husk emerges the adult Magala, a true elder dragon of brilliant gold. The Shagaru Magala. Upon emerging, the sensory organ that was once the Magala's trump card falls dormant, never to wake again. For now, the Shagaru Magala has sharp eyes and doesn't need any tricks to see its enemies. Its golden hide is just as tough as the black armor it once wore, and its feelers have hardened into true horns, always extended. The fur on its wings has vanished, as the particles it once shed are now obsolete thanks to the Shagaru's eyes. It is, in short, a more complete creature, fully aware of its surroundings, and ready to conquer them. While the Gormagala is a recent discovery, hence its bizarre non-classification, the Shagaru Magala has been spoken of in legends for eons, an elder dragon of such ferocity and might that it turns the mountaintops it inhabits into smoldering wastelands. Its strong wing arms can crush bone and rock with ease, and its thick tail can swipe smaller creatures to death. Its golden coat of scales does not lose anything in durability, but is much lighter than the black armor of the Gormagala, thus making a Shagaru at that much faster. But the Shagaru Magala's true terror lies not in what it gained upon maturing, but in what it retained. The Frenzy Virus. While the fur that once held the pathogen is now gone, the virus itself is still produced within the Magala's body and ejected through the mouth and the skin, now in an even higher concentration. What's more, the Shagaru Magala can, through an unknown mechanism, concentrate the virus into a visible mass of light and energy, unleashed as explosions and beams that not only decimate anything they hit, but that leave behind a trail of disease and infection, dooming even idle bystanders to a painful, frenzied death. Shagaru Magala are thus a devastating force wherever they appear, and their preference for the mountains around the citadel would likely have spelled disaster for the entire region. I was paralyzed with fear. It was then that I noticed a young boy squirming for his life underneath the dragon's claws. My brave friend slashed at the beast to protect the boy, but he hardly made a scratch. He urged me to flee with the child. But disaster did not come. While the Magala appear sporadically in the area in order to molt, they rarely stick around for long, indicating that they are being repelled by… something. Some powerful deterrent force, fierce enough to intimidate the peerless Shagaru Magala itself. Indeed, the Citadel does have such an entity. Or perhaps, it would be more appropriate to say, it used to. Back when this area was first settled, all the way to the current day, one legend about the Citadel is repeated with deep veneration. In the deep green forests, riding the wind, lives a benevolent silver dragon. This shining knight of the shadowy woods protects the land and its people. Many of the village elders insist that they had seen this dragon in their youth, a gentle creature that lived in peace alongside humans. Little did they know that those were likely the last time this forest guardian would be seen in its original glory. As when it next appeared, on the fateful night the citadel fell, it was a twisted, corrupted shell of its former self. It was in this state that this dragon was recorded and classified by the guild as an elder dragon and given the name Malzino. Little of its original identity remains. While it is still covered in a coat of silver scales, many of them have been discolored in a pinkish red, 
Its sunken eyes now sit in blackened sockets, while its golden horns form a false crown. While it is unknown how and when the Malzino changed, it likely has to do with the most striking difference between the dragon of legend and the dragon we observe today. The squirming mass of blood parasites that remains attached to the Malzino at various spots of its body. These critters, called Curio, have absolutely infested the Malzino, living both outside and inside the creature's body. It is safe to assume that, at some point in the recent past, a Malzino entered into a symbiosis with these parasites. They get to nest on and inside the dragon for safety, and even get to drink its blood occasionally. And in return, they follow the Malzino's command. Curio have the ability to suck life force out of any creature they attach themselves to, and they transfer that energy to their host as rent payment. After this contract was formed, it is likely that the Curio gradually infected the entire species, being passed from individual to individual, parent to child, sibling to sibling, similar to how the Brachidios are believed to have evolved their slime symbiosis. So, now, all Malzino sightings, without exception, are accompanied by these bloody parasites. A side effect of the Curio is that they affect the neurology of both their host and their victims. The saliva of the Curio functions as a powerful stimulant, in order to get the blood flowing so that they have easier access to the life force. So anytime they suck or transfer life energy, they also cause an increase in aggression. The Malzino, who is constantly doused in Curio, has thus become a fiend of pure hostility, attacking anything it finds in the hopes of extracting its life force and feeding on it through the Curio. The benevolent guardian of the woods, reduced to a base predator thirsting for blood and filth. Armed with these parasites, the Malzino is a force to be reckoned with. Its wing claws are long and sharp, allowing it to use them as swiping blades. Its tail has three foldable sharp prongs, which can both impale and grab targets depending on whether or not they're unfolded, giving the tail massive utility. Its sharp front claws are flexible and can slash as well as grab. And all of its moves can be further enhanced by the life energy of the Curio, which can even be compressed into spheres or grounded explosions for even more massive damage. Once the Malzino has fed enough on the life force of its enemy, it will enter a state called the Bloodening. As the skin of the Malzino darkens, and the deep red discolorations of its scales alight brightly, it gains newfound speed of such magnitude that it at times becomes entirely invisible to the human eye as it moves. Its raging attacks become much more ferocious, and more and more of the energy provided by the Curio begins spilling out of its body, making it a walking disaster. But while the Malzino commands the Curio in its body, and benefits greatly from them, it does not seem to be the originator or true master of these parasites. They are spread far and wide, and their origin is, as of yet, unknown. But what is known is that these tiny red flying lampreys took a noble, kind guardian of the forest and twisted it into a deadly bloodhound. I took the boy's hand and escaped the ruins of the city as my friend battled Malzino. In the distance, the sun started to rise. The tragedy of the citadel is a stark reminder of how unpredictable nature truly is. For years, decades, there can be stability, only to be whisked away in a single night. Now. The culture and humanity which once lived in unison with the creatures of land are now only echoed in the ruins now inhabited by their very usurpers. Nothing lasts, 
everything changes. But within it all lies the beauty of human courage and of nature's ferocity. Two forces, bound forever in fierce brotherhood and loving conflict. As always, thank you so much for watching, and a special thank you to all of our patrons, including Fictionape, Cini, Anthony the Hedgehog, Arcturian711, Big Pidge, Claire Miboon, Danilo Villavicencio, Gio, Hubble Mirror 123, Jameson Tate, Magenta Magenta, Makote O2, Mench, Mr. Pyramid, Mr. Meander, Pitifuego, Peroscoco, Person212, Project Iceman, Russell, Oakwood Tree, Vulgar Beast, Iron Camel, and Courage. Again, thank you all so much, and I will see you next time. Be safe. Bye-bye.